morning, everybody. Uh, it's really early in the morning. It's too early for Turkey, especially for Bodrum. I appreciate everybody uh, coming in. Uh, so uh, today, uh, I'll talk a little bit different compared to the superconductivity talks. I'll switch the subject to 2D material. Then I'll try to uh, give my two cents about the why uh, Describing the magnetic properties of the two materials is difficult, and why uh, we uh, we have to be careful to describe uh, these things. So uh, I'm coming from Ankara, Bilkent University, uh, and I'll start with a, a, a few slides of introduction. Probably I will not need that detail. I'll uh, uh, go uh, very fast through this. So everything uh, of 2D physics starts with the I can say with graphene, uh, that's not uh, that uh, wrong. Uh, so to, at the end of the 2004, when uh, Gaiman Novoselov exfoliated uh, graphene, a single sheet of the graphite, uh, so a new era uh, uh, has been started. So it's a very simple material. Uh, so the basic property of the, these materials is the, just a single layer of things. In a minute, I'll show actually these are quasi 2D, they're not a small thickness as well, but they sh uh, show uh, excellent uh, material uh, properties. Uh, graphene itself, very light, very strong, uh, and so on. So these are the well known things. Uh, uh, so uh, this uh, actually uh, start uh, with a very simple property, it has a very si uh, simple band structure. When you look at the Fermi level of the, these pi bands, uh, around the Fermi level, it shows a linear dispersion. Just because of that, uh, you end up uh, massless uh, uh, fermions uh, uh, here, uh, which has the very high uh, mobility because of the, this uh, special uh, dispersion relation here. Then. Uh, a lot of uh, properties uh, observed and uh, predicted. Uh, one of the recent ones just opened uh, a new era within this uh, field. You just start uh, with a bilayer of the uh, graphene, so this just two sheets of the carbon. Uh, then you uh, just rotate a little bit, like uh, one degree is uh, very small. So there is uh, no other uh, alteration on the system no doping, no uh, so on, then you end up with this uh, magic angle, uh, uh, office uh, more pattern, but interestingly, uh, uh, it shows the superconductivity at the uh, very low temperature, but it's a very pure system. Uh, it's a quite uh, exotic uh, superconductivity observed uh, this uh, uh, four years ago on this system. Uh, so the, all these studies, uh, two of these studies, started by uh, Gaiman and Novoselo, so they end up with the Nobel Prize, uh, 2010 Nobel Prize. Uh, but today, uh, actually, I will not talk about the graphene. I'll talk with the, some uh, other materials. So that's the starting point of the iceberg. Uh, uh, first, starting from the group four elements, the silicon, germanium, uh, and so on. Then uh, uh, next uh, to carbon, boron, nitride. So these are the first systems were tried uh, as a 2D systems, but later on uh, this uh, extended to the transition metal decalcogenates. Uh, then different actually uh, combination from the periodic table uh, and uh, maxines as well. So today uh, I'll talk mostly on these uh, maxines, but there are uh, a zoo of the uh, different materials. Some of them entirely uh, two-dimensional, some of them, like the phosphorine uh, shown here, shows uh, some pocket structures at certain height, uh, or in, uh, I think, uh, this one, uh, like transition metal decalcogenates, it's a, it's a three-layer uh, thickness, uh, but essentially all of them are uh, showing the uh, two-dimensional confinement and uh, two-dimensional uh, different properties uh, 
arrive from uh, that. So just uh, to summarize the interest on this system, uh, just uh, look at the number of publications on this one. Obviously, the graphene was the uh, first introduced one. That's the leading one, but uh, you see uh, uh, just a single keyword, graphene, so that includes uh, all sorts of the applications, synthesis, calculations, and so on, uh, was uh, already uh, uh, a few uh, 10,000 so the uh, publications just on, on graphene, and the other systems are uh, uh, rising fast. So today I'll confine on the maxines. That's the new family, uh, but that becomes very popular on recent years because of several applications, like the uh, battery applications, capacitor applications, uh, and so on. Today I'll talk about the uh, magnetic properties. Uh, Okay, uh, if you are uh, coming from the uh, theoretical uh, uh, area, uh, we have a, a powerful tool to predict the, these new materials uh, and the, uh, their properties. It's just based on the density functional theory. Uh, so uh, effectively, this theory is just mapping the <coughs> many body problem to just uh, in terms of the uh, density functional. So this multi-dimensional uh, complicated problem is just mapped to a, a single electron uh, problem uh, via uh, Consham equations. So then uh, we can computationally solve uh, many different uh, systems. So I'll just go past this part. Uh, so when you deal with a new uh, two-dimensional system, uh, first uh, what people try, uh, uh, I mean, uh, from the periodic table, actually try to match uh, different elements, uh, try to make the different compounds, uh, and so on. So you check the uh, stability of the, these systems, first from the energy calculations, uh, then you look at the mechanical stability, dynamical stability, and so on. So one uh, easy way is just looking at the phonon dispersions. If you end up uh, uh, all real frequencies, uh, then uh, that means that system uh, dynamically stable. So for example, here on this one, there is a, a branch with the uh, negative frequencies. So that's, that's the soft mode. Uh, so this is an instable. But on the other hand, if you have a system uh, like magnesium oxide, uh, strontium selenite, and so on, these are all uh, uh, positive frequencies, so those are uh, dynamically stable systems. Uh, so today I'll talk about the Maxines. This is another family, but I'll uh, come this later. Uh, let's skip this uh, slide for the moment and let's uh, start uh, talking to the uh, magnetic properties. Uh, okay, so first uh, I'll give a uh, a very uh, uh, fast, uh, short uh, review uh, of these uh, systems. So uh, obviously, uh, uh, besides these exotic properties, the magnetic properties also attract a lot of uh, attention. People uh, try to uh, establish uh, uh, magnetic uh, to these systems as well because of the uh, several uh, uh, applications, the spontronics, nanomagnetisms, uh, uh, looking for uh, new materials, uh, robust magnetic properties uh, uh, for uh, all sorts of the applications. So there are uh, uh, two different type of the uh, approach. We might have an intrinsic magnetism. Uh, so on systems like uh, chron uh, chromium three halides. Uh, so for example chromium-3 iodide, uh, and so on. I'll show some data on that. Uh, these systems uh, are uh, synthesized, and they are uh, exhibiting these uh, magnetic properties. But uh, besides on that, uh, there are systems with extrinsic magnetism. So for example, if you look at the graphene itself, uh, 
uh, carbon is non-magnetic, but when you introduce the defects, the vacancies and so on, you can introduce uh, magnetism on uh, those uh, systems uh, as well. So uh, actually this brings uh, a lot of flexibility. Uh, so you make the engineering of this uh, uh, using uh, defect engineering, functionalization, doping, uh, and so on. But that brings the uh, difficulty uh, as well. So uh, uh, just uh, I can extend that uh, to the uh, challenges. So first of all, the important one is the ambient stability. So these systems uh, should work on uh, under the ambient conditions. Uh, then uh, you can show the prototype. Uh, then uh, scalability is important for the many different device applications and so on. Uh, but at this stage, actually, what, uh, what is more critical is, uh, for example, the transition temperatures. So uh, uh, this has to be uh, at least, for example, uh, operate uh, ambient uh, uh, temperatures. Uh, so uh, usually uh, the calculations and experiments done at the low temperature, uh, cryogenic temperatures and so on. Uh, so uh, understanding uh, or establishing the material with the higher uh, transition temperature is also uh, important, one of the challenges uh, on this system. Uh, so there are obviously two different type of the approaches. Uh, people uh, experimentally uh, try to establish this type of the systems. But uh, besides, actually, there are uh, several theoretical uh, approaches as well. Once uh, you predict a system with high magnetic moments uh, and magnetic properties, then uh, you can uh, convince the people, uh, go ahead, uh, try to synthesize uh, these systems uh, and so on. So here, uh, I'll provide a long list from this uh, uh, review. Uh, many, many different systems uh, tried as a paramagnetic, antiparamagnetic, uh, different uh, systems uh, as well. Uh, as I said, uh, because of the, uh, these uh, promising uh, applications, uh, the effort is uh, huge. People uh, try to establish these things. Here, uh, OK, what I'm just uh, showing in recent years, especially you see several uh, studies just uh, uh, appearing on the uh, literature, and now even we have some uh, reviews appearing uh, around that. But let me start. What is the uh, challenge here? Uh, from uh, theoretical science, I'll confine over the theoretical science, but from experimental science, as I try to say, uh, to establish a, a uh, stability at the ambient condition. Even, I mean, you can introduce the defect, but the controlling the defects, engineering, and so on, these are the challenging things. But from a theoretical point of view, uh, actually, uh, I can uh, try to, uh, I uh, prepare a slide, then I remove that slide. Uh, on the single material system, let's say, from the maxims, uh, let's say titanium uh, carbide, uh, I can show at least 10 or 15 papers, calculations, all uh, published on uh, established uh, journals and so on, all uh, reporting uh, different numbers regarding the uh, transition temperatures uh, and so on. So for example, uh, uh, you need to use uh, um, one way of uh, uh, analyzing this is just introduce the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Then uh, you have to parameterize the J parameters, the coupling parameters uh, in the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. In order to that, you start from the uh, density functional theory calculations. Uh, for different states, uh, uh, just using the uh, uh, total energy is coming from the DFT. Uh, you can uh, solve for the, these uh, coupling parameters. Then uh, using the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, you can go and do the Monte Carlo calculations to get the uh, Curie temperatures and so on. Uh, but 
that part of the uh, literature, uh, I believe it is very dirty. Uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, important gradient might be missing. So today uh, I'll try to address uh, one of them. Uh, uh, simply the Hubbard view, uh, Hubbard model and the uh, DFT plus uh, view. What I'll claim actually you will need uh, this approach uh, 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 to uh, have a, a correct numbers uh, for the coupling parameters uh, and get the uh, correct description uh, as the transition uh, and so on. So, I mean, the answer is actually simple. Why uh, we need the Hubbard correction? Actually, uh, we, uh, on these systems, uh, uh, mostly they include the transition metals uh, and so on. So there are D electrons uh, and even a system uh, with F electrons. So these are uh, strongly localized uh, electrons. So if you start from the uh, standard uh, DFT, the self-interaction uh, is not described properly with the uh, ground state uh, DFT calculations. So uh, especially for these uh, localized orbitals, uh, uh, we need uh, some uh, correction uh, uh, in order to proper uh, description of the, uh, this guy. So if you start, I will show the uh, couple of examples you will clearly see uh, Within the, uh, this uh, standard approach, standard uh, ground state DFT, I mean the well-known uh, uh, deficiencies, for example, uh, in incorrect estimation of the band gap, usually uh, you predict the lower band gap with the LDA uh, uh, calculation. Even uh, sometimes you end up with the metallic state uh, instead of a small gap uh, and so on. So obviously, uh, once you have uh, uh, some uh, deficiency in the electronic band structure, then uh, that will reflect to the uh, structural properties uh, than the uh, magnetic properties uh, as well. So this is, uh, I think the reference will come in the next slide, sorry, uh, it's missing. So I'm reporting this uh, from literature, uh, nickel oxide and the iron oxide. So these are uh, standard uh, DFT calculations. Uh, using the GGA functionals. So if you uh, look at both of them, uh, is not correct. So here in the nickel oxide, uh, you see uh, there's a gap in the density of states or this is the uh, energy levels. There is a gap, but that gap is underestimated and the uh, oxygen free states uh, here, this green line here, this is the edge of the valence band. It's just uh, appears at the edge of the valence band there. Uh, then on the uh, iron oxide, that's more severe. Actually, the Fermi level, the Fermi level is set to zero on both of the plots. The Fermi level is just uh, uh, within the uh, band and uh, no gap at all. Uh, this is predicted as a, a metallic ground state from the uh, GGA calculation. Obviously, uh, both of them uh, are uh, wrong. I'll, I'll show the correction in a minute. Uh, you will see the uh, difference. So uh, uh, we need to, uh, some uh, fix uh, of this uh, 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 self-interaction, uh, uh, correct, uh, correctly describing the uh, self-interaction of the electrons uh, within the standard DFT approach. So in recent years, uh, several methods uh, developed. So you might go the hybrid functionals. So instead of just using LDA, GGA, uh, now the HSC type of the calculation uh, uh, R becomes more uh, common. In these calculations, then uh, you will see the band gap uh, is uh, expanded uh, and it goes to the uh, correct direction. Uh, approaching to the experimental uh, values uh, and so on. Uh, then even uh, some uh, more uh, complicated functionals uh, are developed just using, for example, uh, second derivative of the electron density. Uh, you might end up with the uh, meta GGA uh, and so on. Uh, one uh, easy way is the so-called the DFT plus U. So you include a, a Hubbard U parameter. Uh, uh, 
as a correction to the uh, DFT Hamiltonian, uh, then uh, you can place the, this uh, localized D level, F level, whatever it is, uh, then uh, you can end up with the uh, correct line structure and uh, you can uh, correct the, uh, these uh, properties. Uh, so, uh, so there are uh, two approaches, but uh, I'll talk them. Uh, uh, so uh, if you are not uh, familiar, uh, the term is uh, very simple. So this is the Hubbard Hamiltonian, so we have the standard uh, hopping term, uh, the first term, then we have this U term, that's the uh, like on-site electron-electron uh, repulsion term. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, U is the uh, what I am referring as the uh, Hubbard U in the uh, DFT plus U uh, corrections. Uh, simply, uh, if you look at as a uh, correction DFT. On top of the DFT, you might have this uh, Hubbard uh, U correction. Uh, so uh, we have a, a simple uh, term just introduced by Dural many years ago, uh, a simple form of the, this uh, correction on, uh, based on the, this uh, density. Uh, uh. But uh, calculation of that, uh, is not that simple, but let me first convince just revisiting the, this previous examples uh, I show. So this is the uh, iron oxide band structure, which is predicted as the matter. So this green line is the Fermi level. You see that's just within the uh, band. Uh, so uh, with that correction, this uh, band gap expand. You see in the band structure or in the density of space, this is expanded. Uh, and you get the correct uh, antiferromagnetic uh, ground state, uh, uh, just uh, including that uh, U-term uh, here. So, okay, so this is working. How uh, uh, this can be uh, uh, fixed? Uh, so the easy way of doing this is a semi-empirical approach, uh, but uh, within this semi-empirical uh, approach, uh, if you are lucky, uh, then uh, you might end up the optimized value. So here I'm just showing one example. This is based on the uh, anatase uh, titanium dioxide. So the balance band, uh, uh, the d orbitals of the titanium uh, just dominate the uh, first balance band, and that's quite critical uh, that, uh, in that region. But the band gap uh, from the standard uh, GGA calculation appears like a 2.7 or, or 2.08 electron volt, that's too low. Uh, that's too low uh, compared to experimental value, uh, which is 3.2 uh, electron volt. So with this semi-empirical approach, what you can do, you can introduce the U value, then do the calculation, look at the band structure. So with U is zero, uh, as I said, this is 2.08. Then for different values of the U, uh, you see the band gap is uh, increasing up to certain point, then it's decreased again. So if you try to uh, get the experimental value here, 3.2, so you need to use the U value like a seven, something like this. But the uh, problem here, you have to look at the uh, structure as well. So while you are correcting the band gap, you might distorting the uh, structure, geometric structure, uh, and so on. So uh, this is uh, it's really uh, uh, empirical. You are just trying to fit some uh, data and try to keep all the properties intact. So uh, not always uh, this is working. And Obviously, if you are doing the first principle calculation, uh, this is not uh, uh, quite a uh, correct approach. So uh, in uh, recent years, ab initio, first principle determination of the Hubbard parameters uh, introduced and studied a lot. So starting from Hartree-Fock-based methods, uh, several of them introduced. I'll just show the linear, uh, linear response approach and the uh, 
recent uh, implementation based on the uh, density functional perturbation theory. So very quickly, in the linear response calculation, uh, you can just follow like this. So if you do as, uh, with the different number of the electrons, if you do DFT calculations that uh, uh, solid curve compared to the uh, exact ones, so this is the dis discrete points, actually there is a this difference. That difference has to be introduced as a uh, correction uh, that uh, uh, difference is just shown as the blue curve. That was introduced uh, uh, on this paper uh, within this linear response uh, approach. Uh, so uh, the basic idea is this, so let's summarize here. So we have a, a, a this term, this uh, projection term uh, included with the, uh, the black part is the standard Gonsham Hamiltonian. Uh, that part uh, uh, introduced uh, as a, so you, on this uh, approach, you introduce a supercell, then you perturb uh, the atom, then you look at the uh, change in the uh, occupation uh, numbers, this N is the occupation numbers or the density you can say, then based on that you can uh, calculate the chi and uh, that difference, uh, uh, perturb and perturb uh, will lead to the uh, 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 Hubbard view uh, uh, parameter. Uh, so, a couple of years ago, actually, this was uh, expanded using the density functional uh, perturbation theory as well. So here, uh, you introduce the perturbation uh, within the unit cell, like a phonon calculations, but with this uh, uh, DFPT, uh, actually, uh, you can uh, do the uh, calculation in the small primitive cell uh, and uh, uh, exactly like the phonon calculation, uh, uh, you can calculate the, this, and uh, this was implemented uh, on this uh, paper. So here, this is just uh, comparing these uh, uh, two approaches here. Uh, so in this one, you need a large cell in the real space, uh, then the uh, two mesh might be small. Uh, with the uh, DFPT, you have a primitive cell, but then uh, you need the uh, Converge k point. Uh, this table is just summarized that. Uh, but with a smaller cell, uh, actually, you get a much faster uh, well converged results uh, and uh, on so on. So, this is just shown on copper oxide, nickel oxide, lit lithium uh, cobalt uh, oxide on three different systems uh, uh, with the convincing results. So, one critical thing is. Here, uh, you have to be uh, uh, very careful about the convergence uh, of the uh, computational parameters. Uh, uh, here, again, uh, from uh, this paper, this is implemented in Quantum Express, so HP.x code. Uh, I'm just reporting this convergence from this uh, paper, very same paper. As you see, uh, uh, with the Q mesh, uh, so these are different uh, K points, so you use this for the Grillion zone sampling, this is for the reciprocal space, like the Q vectors of the phonon calculations, uh, there is a strong change uh, on that one. Uh, so this is for three different systems, all these three different systems show to these fluctuations, actually you have to well converge both K and uh, in terms of the Q, uh, so that's the one critical thing of uh, this uh, perturbation theory approach. Uh, then uh, another uh, critical one uh, uh, is to determine uh, this U parameter in a self-consistent manner, okay? So in the empirical one I showed you tried you get compared with the band gap and so on. So within this approach, uh, this is Kula ab initio, and uh, you can do this uh, uh, in a self-consistent manner, then uh, you get the, uh, uh, this might be critical, I'll show, uh, you will see. So you start with uh, some initial structure, uh, you relax that, okay, you get the uh, ground state of that, then you do the uh, 
for uh, DFPT uh, calculation, you get the value of the uh, Hubble parameter. Then with the Hubble parameter, you check the structure again. Uh, uh, then from that structure, you get the uh, Hubble view. You compare the initial one and the uh, out. If they are same within the tolerance, then you said both the structure and the parameter converge, then you can continue with that. Otherwise, uh, you return back, you relax the system, you do the uh, Hubble view calculation again, uh, and so on, so on. So this is important. Uh, so let me make uh, this command. In the literature, actually, this type of the calculation appears very recently. In the literature, if you look at the, this uh, Hubble view calculation, usually they say uh, a number without uh, this type of the uh, test and so on, uh, and uh, just using that number for any system. Okay, let's say it's like an iron oxide and say, okay, for iron, uh, I'm using the U parameter as four electron volt. So it might appear in one of the, in one system, uh, in one calculation. So uh, the usual approach within the literature, uh, just using that number without verifying that and so on. But you will see that actually this uh, structural optimization, the self-transmissive approach is really important. So we uh, studied that. Uh, so this is another example just showing uh, this approach is working. But let me directly jump uh, to our system. So we uh, explore this on the Maxines uh, in detail. The Maxines is uh, very, uh, become, became very popular in recent years uh, that introduced 2004 uh, uh, by uh, Gogotti and uh, his workers. The system is very simple. Uh, that uh, the chemical formula, the max, you start from the, this uh, chemical formula. M is uh, this yellow part. This is early transition metal here, okay? Uh, then the X is either carbon or nitrogen. Then in between, we have this A, this green part uh, from the uh, periodic table. So on that max phase that's available uh, as a bulk for many years, 30, 40 years this is available. So the bulk structure is like that. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, it's a layer structure. So uh, on contrary to the graphene, uh, in the graphene the layers uh, uh, come together with a uh, Van der Waals interaction. Here, uh, they uh, come together via this uh, uh, group A element. So these blue balls are just from uh, this part, for example, aluminum is just connecting uh, these uh, different layers. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can start from this bulk material, then uh, very easily you can etch this uh, elements here, it can be one of these, usually it is aluminum, you can etch the aluminum away, then you end up with uh, these uh, maxine layers, two-dimensional material. And in recent years, the several applications are just uh, predicted, uh, confirmed uh, on this system. So here, uh, we start with the pristine form, both the uh, carbon and the nitrogen one. Okay, this is quite boring, but uh, just don't try to read, I will show the uh, graph of this. What I'm showing, so we have uh, some different transition metals from uh, uh, row three, row four, uh, row five, uh, and so on. What I'm showing here, three different scales. So this is a non-magnetic one, ferromagnetic one, and antiferromagnetic one, each calculated self-consistently. That each relax, uh, geometry, uh, U-calculation, and after end of the uh, self-consistent cycle, this table established. So what this tells, the first message from here, so for example, just pick uh, one of the uh, guys, so for example, one adium carbide, the second term. So the lattice constant, non-magnetic, it is 2.9 angstrom, with almost 5 EV uh, U-parameter. In the ferromagnetic states, obviously, uh, lattice parameters change, this lattice expand, and the U parameters are also different. 
instead of 5 EV, now that appears like a 4.8 EV. And in the antiferromagnetic states, actually this is completely different. It's uh, like a 4.2 EV and much expanded lattice. So with a single U value, uh, obviously it does not correctly describe each of the, these, even within the single material, these, uh, these changing. So this is my uh, first message. So if you look at the same data for that, uh, so this is the U parameter. So this is the row three. Uh, so there's a, a trend, uh, slowly increasing trend. Even uh, some peculiarities, for example, Mangan shows a uh, peculiarity over there, Nickel as well. But for uh, group four, group five, more uh, smoother. Uh, but there's a variation even within the three different phases uh, of uh, the very same material. Uh, as I said, so for example, in the nickel, you see uh, the antiferromagnetic uh, U is much, much different than uh, ferromagnetic or the uh, uh, other one. And the lattice parameters of this is uh, changing uh, uh, as well with the different phases. And very quickly, uh, so if you look at the, now, uh, this is just reporting the magnetic moment for this system. So uh, you see, for example, titanium carbide, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, but these each calculated uh, with the use, as I said, from the uh, uh, corresponding phase uh, U. Not the single phase, not a random one, self-consistently uh, calculated uh, U. Then uh, here uh, we just report the, uh, their uh, ground phase. Uh, uh, you see uh, uh, many different variations, and some of them uh, are uh, non-magnetic uh, and so on. Uh, sorry, this is just a bunch of numbers. Uh, bar graphs would be nicer, but uh, in the last maybe one minute, uh, let me summarize. So what's happening, uh, the basic physics here, I can just give one example. Uh, uh, similar things happening. So this is the density of states, uh, okay, for the non-magnetic state. Uh, with the uh, U parameters is zero, is the, this pink or the red one. Then uh, the convergence U is 4.05 EV. Uh, this applies titanium 3D orbitals. So when you apply, uh, you see from that pink shifted uh, a little bit uh, with the non-magnetic one, uh, but uh, not that much. So if you, sorry. If you look at here, uh, we have a, like a 1.2 Bohr magneton uh, in the ferromagnetic states, 0.85 in the antiferromagnetic state. Uh, uh, magnetic moment and its ground state is the uh, antiferromagnetic. Just keeping that mind, if you look at here, uh, so in the antiferromagnetic state, uh, as you see, uh, the shift is much appreciable. You can see uh, the, this is U0, then the light blue is uh, with the U applied there. You see that those peaks are shifted down there, and that shift actually different for the upspin and the downspin, and that splitting leads to the this magnetic moment. And uh, so essentially, I mean, this is similar. I will not go one by one. Uh, you see with the U parameter, this is for cranium, uh, chromium uh, carbide. Uh, the shift is, uh, this is upspin, downspin, uh, d orbitals just moving uh, different directions opening the sometimes gap, sometimes lead to the uh, semi-metallic cases, uh, placing these localized uh, orbitals on the correct place, uh, you end up with the actually correct description uh, and so on. So uh, these uh, calculations carried uh, by the uh, Sibel, and uh, this is the collaboration by the, this team. Uh, so my main message here, actually, you have to, uh, incorporate uh, 
uh, Hubble drew correction to describe the magnetic properties correctly, and you have to determine these uh, cell consistency. So uh, just a number picking from the literature is just given uh, some correction, but that's not the correct one. As I clearly show, even within the same material, there is a, a magnetic phase, a different magnetic phase described by a different uh, Hubbard view parameter. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very interesting insights into the 2D materials and the parameter extractions. Do we have some questions? I'd like to start with a question, and uh, you introduced uh, the approach by using the density function. And uh, my, my question is about uh, including the temperature in the modeling. So how does the parameter depend on temperature, and is it possible to extract? Uh, okay. So actually, uh, I just concentrated over this part, and I uh, just uh, didn't show the slide. So in order to study magnetic properties, uh, what we did is the, the initial stage is starting from this density functional theory calculation. Yeah. So uh, with this, uh, so for example, uh, this is one of the systems. Uh, what you do, uh, this is tough to uh, 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 you introduce different uh, spin configurations. So we might have the ferromagnetic one, then in the antiferromagnetic, we might have the different structures. You do uh, the DFT calculations on all of these system, then using these uh, energies, mm -hmm. uh, you can solve the coupling parameters, mm -hmm. J1, uh, J prime, and so on for the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So actually, you need this uh, second calculation. Uh, once you have the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, uh, two different, a couple of different approaches might be possible, but the most common is the Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. Then you do the Monte Carlo with those parameters, uh, then you get the uh, specific heat, uh, the transition temperature, and all uh, those properties. So I didn't show that, I'll just concentrate the initial stage, since in the literature, these J parameters, in different papers, you see the different J parameters and so on, but it should be unique for the same system. Uh, with those uh, correct J's, then you do the uh, Monte Carlo or similar calculation for the temperature. Mm -hmm. So, is there any other question? I don't see a further question, but we have plenty of time after the plenary talks to talk to you, but before we switch to the second speaker, I'd like to thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.